the Persian Empire, an innovative and militaristic world superpower that ruled ancient Mesopotamia and at one point accounted for more than 40% of the world's population. The Greeks, a loose alliance of city-states that dominated the Mediterranean and whose progressive political, philosophical, and social advances lay the base for Western civilization today. These two ancient superpowers came together in a 50-year conflict known as the Greco-Persian Wars, a devastating confrontation that was sparked in the year 499 BC with an event known as the Ionian Revolt. The year is 518 BC, and after the initial conquering of Lydia by the Persian King Cyrus in 547 BC, nearly the entire western Mediterranean coast of Asia Minor is ruled by the Persians and their king, Darius. This conquered area includes Ionian Greece, a situation of city-states on and just off of Asia Minor's Mediterranean coast. This area was settled by Greeks in approximately 1000 BC after the Dorian immigration from the north, an event which pushed the ancestors of Ionian Greeks across the Aegean Sea. Here, the Ionian Greeks lived under their own control until being subjected to new rulers under their Persian invaders. To ensure some loyalty from their Greek subjects, the Persians appointed Greek-born but Persian-sympathizing tyrants for every city-state, known as satraps. This appointment provides a false pretense of control to the Greeks, while in reality, the Persians have complete control of their puppet rulers. While this may have appeased some, there was still deep resentment that rumbled within the Greek population. The time at which the Ionian Greeks lost their power to the Persians was one of exploration and experimentation with their political systems. Some of these Ionian city-states were developing forms of democracy, just as Athens was doing around the same time. This anti-tyrannical sentiment was increased by tenfold because of the appointment of Greek citizens to act as the rulers. While the Persians may have seen the Greek rulers as wise substitutes for themselves, the freedom-loving Greeks felt betrayed by having a former countryman running their city-state. No doubt the Ionian Greeks recognized these tyrants as the Persians in disguise, and would have looked upon their once fellow Greeks as treasonous. Another cause, suggested by historians such as Herodotus, states that the Ionians resented the Persians due to economic reasons. In the late 6th century to early 5th century BC, the Mediterranean Sea was an area of abundant trade. The Ionians were extremely successful in trade at this time, a success that would have been increased under the powerful connections of an empire such as Persia. However, the Persians demanded large sums of taxes at this time, an amount seen by the Ionians as unfair compared to other regions of Persia's empire. The resentment caused by the restriction of wealth of these Ionian city-states is also a contributing factor to the eagerness in which the Ionians responded to the call to revolt. One major criticism of the validity of the known history of the Greco-Persian Wars is its source. The only known documentation of the Ionian revolt and wars are from Herodotus an ancient historian attributed with the invention of history. The significance of this is that Herodotus was Greek, leading many to believe that Herodotus gave a biased account of the war that portrays the Persians poorly and falsely. As documented by Herodotus, the spark that ignited the revolt occurred in the year 499 BC, with the Ionians still under the control of King Darius and the Persians. At this time, the Persians were strong enough to march further west into mainland Greece, a step that must first be taken into the Aegean Sea. Resting immediately in between Asia Minor and Greece are the Cyclades, a group of islands, the most prosperous of those being the city-state of Naxos. In comes Aristagoras, the noble, rich, Greek-born, but Persian-appointed tyrant of Miletus, the most prosperous of the Ionian city-states. After being persuaded by a group of rich Naxians who had been exiled and desperate to go home, and also recognizing Naxos as a potential addition to his control, Aristagoras set his sights on capturing Naxos. Understanding that Miletus alone would not have enough power to capture Naxos, Aristagoras appealed to Atrophernes, the governor of Lydia. Atrophernes then went to his cousin, King Darius, to ask for reinforcements to capture Naxos. 
What Aristagoras was granted was 200 warships, as well as a large army under the command of the king's brother, Megabates. With an ample amount of ships and a large army under the Persian commander Megabates, the Persians and Ionians sailed to Naxos and laid siege. Intertwined with the constant power struggle between Megabates and Aristagoras, and having to contend with a well-prepared Naxos, after four months, the siege was declared a loss, and the Persians and Ionians sailed home. The failure to capture Naxos meant much more to Aristagoras than just a poor reputation. Not only did Aristagoras owe copious amounts of money to the Persians who supplied the failed siege, but he also made enemies with Megabates, who as mentioned was King Darius' brother. This left Aristagoras with one choice, be stripped of his titles and be most likely killed, or revolt. Okay, so before we go into how the revolt started, I would like to explain some of the reasons for the revolt. Reasons include an anti-tyrant feeling, having to pay tribute to a new Persian king, the king's failure to understand the Greeks' need for freedom, and many more. Before the revolt, a man named Aristagoras wanted to rise and gain power within the Persian Empire. The way to secure power within the Empire was to integrate himself with the Persians. In order to do this, he would have to gain Persia a great victory. So Aristagoras persuaded the Persians to attempt to take the island city-state of Naxos. Unfortunately for Aristagoras, the expedition failed and the Persians blamed this loss on him. Aristagoras also owed a lot of money to the Persians to make things a lot worse. To protect himself, Aristagoras had to persuade the people of Miletus to rebel in the name of Greek liberty. The citizens of Miletus, already resistant to Persian rule, supported Aristagoras. The rebels killed the local Persian garrison and freed the city. Of course, Miletus could not stand up against the Persian Empire alone. They needed help. Aristagoras got support from the Greek cities of Athens and Eritrea, who wanted to support the revolt against the Persians. They sent ships to meet with the Miletian army at Ephesus, where they would prepare their assault on Sardis. The Persians were caught off guard when the Ionian army attacked. Sardis had a strong military contingent who barricaded themselves along with Artiphanes in the citadel. The Ionians attacked the lower city and fires were set all around. By now neighboring Persian cities had heard of the siege and sent help. Artaphernes' army attacked the Ionians from the citadel, driving them back to Ephesus. The Persian reinforcements followed them, and most of the Ionian army was killed or retreated at Ephesus. The defeat did not discourage Aristagoras, who sent men both north and south to spread the word of the revolt. They were able to come in contact with the cities of Hellespont and Propontis, to the north and Caria to the south. These cities joined the revolt. Other areas like the Kingdom of Cyprus also joined the revolt when they saw how far it had spread. The Ionian revolt now included cities along the entire western coast of what is now Turkey. Over the next years, several fights between the Persians and the Ionians did not result in any significant gains for either side. Darius became impatient and withdrew the Persian forces to come up with a better plan. The Persians' counteroffensive efforts were seen in a variety of battles and different locations. Though it can be considered part of the Ionian offensive campaign, the first example of the Persians attacking the Ionians was seen in the Battle of Ephesus. The Battle of Ephesus happened in response to the Ionians' attack on Sardis. The Persians gained support of the Lydians and traveled to Sardis to raid the Ionians. After realizing that the Greeks had left, they followed their tracks to Ephesus where they caught up to them. The Persians' ability to catch the Greeks showed that they most likely rode horses, again proving the Persians' advanced military strength. This was also a very strategic attack. They chose to wear the Greeks down until defeat was unavoidable. The strategy worked, and the Greeks proved to be no match for the Persian army, who went on to kill many Ionians, including Euclides. Other Greeks were forced to return to their home city or sail back to Greece. A second example of the Persian counteroffensive was in 497 BC. Darius, leader of Persia, went through a major reform in 497. He assigned three of his brothers to take charge of three armies. His first brother, Darius, 
went for Hellas Point and used a very tactical strategy. In doing so, he not only conquered Hellas Point, but also many other cities around it. Darius' second brother, Hymaeus, he took his army to Propontis, and later his third brother would join in the campaign against Ionia. It was years later when Aristagoras chose to leave the city of Miletus as well as the revolt behind. He took his faction and began an attack on Thace. There is much debate why he did this. Some people believe that he couldn't deal with the lack of success the revolt had. Others believe there is a problem within Miletus that he did not want to have to deal with. I, however, believe that he went to Thace in order to search for natural resources that he believed to be there. It was in Thace that Aristagoras was killed. This began the downward spiral of the revolt, He was, as he was the original inspiration behind the uprising. Intensive efforts by the Persians continued during the Battle of Marsysis. Caria, after deciding to join the revolt, was targeted immediately by Persia. A river that laid between the Persians and the Carians became a large factor in this battle. The Carian king suggested that his army cross the river. The idea behind this was to stop the Persians in their tracks and not allow them to come into the city whatsoever. However, the people disagreed. They decided to keep the Carian army in the city and make the Persians cross the river. Doing this made the city more protected, however, the Persians ended up overpowering them anyway. Though the Persians' first and second attempt against the Carians was extremely successful, the third one was almost the complete opposite. After the original attack by the Persians, the Carians still had enough strength to regroup. They wanted to get redemption against the Persians, so to do so, they ambushed them on the road that went through Pedasus. The Persians arrived at the road during night, and the Carians put their plan into play. The element of surprise worked in their favor as they destroyed the Persian army. Though the Carian army may not have been as advanced or as strong as the Persians, the Persians were not ready for the surprise attack. This was significant for two reasons. One, it was one of the biggest losses for the Persians during their counteroffensive campaign. Secondly, it pushed, put a partial stalemate on the war for a couple of years and both sides became less active. For one of the final battles, the Persians focused a major attack on Miletus, the center of the revolt. In order to increase their chances of success, they not only attacked on land, but also on sea. The Ionians responded with a joint force that included Phoenicians, Cyprus, Ecclesia, and Egypt. Their strategy was to focus their on the sea attacks while letting the Milesians deal with the battle on land. To prepare, the Ionians moved their sea defense to Laid. It was at this point that both sides recognized that the bulk of this battle would take place on the water. The Persians were not sure if they could take the Ionians, so they ordered all their tyrants to Laid and told them to try to convince the Ionians to come to the Persian side. This ended with the Sumerians agreeing to side with the Persians. When the battle began, the Sumerians stayed true to their word and backed off. This caused for other Greek alliances, such as the Lesbians, to retreat. This weakened the Ionian forces significantly. They now had little to no chance of winning the battle. The end of the revolt came in 494 BC. After six hard years of fighting, the Persians were now ready to gather all their troops and try and end the revolution and restore their power in Asia Minor. The Persians decided to go straight to Miletus and try to end the revolution at its strongest point. The Ionians heard about this big attack coming to Miletus, and they knew if they let the Persians land their forces there, they wouldn't stand a chance against them. So they gathered all their ships they could find and gathered men from all over Greece to try and make a final stand against the Persians. They managed to get 350 Cheerians, but the Persians sent diplomats to try and convince some of the people to abandon the Ionians and go back to their cities so that they would be spared. Eventually some groups decided to give in and left the Laid and went back to their cities. The Persians now had a relatively easy battle against what remained of the Ionian fleet, and they captured Miletus. They destroyed the city killed all the men and enslaved all the women and children in the area. The Persians stayed in Miletus until 493 BC to make sure that there wouldn't be any more revolts. After that, they set out to capture smaller islands in the Aegean Sea. The Persians captured the remaining rebels and then returned home. 
After the Persians left, it only took a few years for the cities that they had conquered to return to a normal state. Please. King Darius was surprisingly lenient, at least to the cities that agreed to submit to Persian rule once again. Darius also brought back the garrisons and taxes to the recaptured city-states. Back in Athens, the Athenians were afraid that because of their involvement in the revolt that Darius would come after them next. Because of the Ionian Revolt, the next 43 years of Greek history will consist of constant battles with the Persian Empire as they attempt to invade the Greek, main the Greek mainland. 